line and a number of guest speakers that are joining us this evening. Um, and you were invited because you're very important to the work of the mm -hmm. Arthritis Foundation. As a major donor, a leadership volunteer with your within your event or for the events, a fundraiser, or just a good friend of the foundation, or perhaps all of the above, um, welcome to tonight's program. Um, my name is Sean Haggerty. I'm the vice president of Order to Cash with Bob Ventus. I have been with Bob Ventus almost 10 years um, from the time we spun off from a company called Smith & Nephew. Uh, I currently reside in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I spend a lot of time in Memphis, Tennessee as I'm running one of our divisions. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for the Foundation Scientific Update. Um, you will hear from a number of leaders uh, in this area, and I'm, we're gonna start off with Rick Willis, who is a Senior Vice President of Community Engagement as he shares some updates on the Arthritis Foundation. Um, and then we've got some folks that are gonna talk about some of the actual research that's being done. I believe the University of Kentucky has got a few speakers that will be introduced, as well as uh, University of North Carolina, a little closer to my hometown. Let me just get things kicked off from a housekeeping perspective. As we begin the call, I wanna review a couple of the housekeeping items. We will be, co we will be recording this call. And we do that so we can send the link out to those who attended and for those others who want to listen in after the event. Please be sure to mute yourself as Sylvia asked so that we can minimize the background noise. Sounds like we're doing pretty good on that. So that's great. Thank you. Um, it does help to be able to everyone hear clearly. There will be a time for Q&A at the end of each presenter. Um, there's a lot of information we're throwing at you tonight. So there, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of great questions. So please feel free to, to hold those questions to the end and we'll address them one at a time as we can. Um, if you prefer, you can also use the chat, the chat feature box if you're using Teams to connect to the call today, which looks like most people are. Um, that, that feature box is located at the top of your screen. Um, and it's a little bubble, I believe. Um, and then let me go to the next slide and introduce our first guest speaker is Rick Willis. He's the Senior VP of Community Engagement at the Arthritis Foundation. I've known Rick for a number of years now. He's a University of Tennessee at Knoxville graduate. We won't hold that against him. Um, and he has dedicated his career to helping people throughout his entire work uh, life. Rick is celebrating seven years at the Arthritis Foundation. And next month, I believe October is your anniversary. Um, he's a constant presence at many of our events, many of our calls and meetings. And he's a strong supporter of the Carolinas chapter that I work with Kathy String on. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Rick Willis. Well, Sean, thank you um, very much. You are a, a hard act to follow, and uh, we've got a we've got a uh, some even better acts that are coming tonight. So I'm going to observe the uh, three fundamentals of public speaking, which is to uh, be bright, be brief, and be gone. So I promise I won't I won't take too much time this evening, but I. I couldn't have a group like this together without uh, just uh, making a few remarks. As I said, we've we've got a great uh, program, and um, we certainly hope that that you're going to hear some things tonight that uh, pique your interest, and that uh, we're we're certainly excited, and we hope that you will be um, as well, because we'd certainly like to talk to you more about where we're going and how we can do more of the great work uh, together that you're going to be hearing about. But you know, I also just uh, again. Um, I want to take the opportunity just to really comment on some things that we're very proud of here um, at the foundation that I think maybe in some ways might set the context for the discussion that we're going to have. You know, I um, th there's a, a phrase or a saying, if you will, that I think we're all familiar with in some shape, fashion, or form, which is that storms make trees roots go deeper. And just I'll just remind everyone, if you're not presenting, just to mute your line, get a little bit of background noise there. Uh, but storms make trees' roots go deeper, and I think it's safe to say that over the last year and a half, uh, all of us have been enduring uh, a storm that's been presented to us by COVID-19. But the thing that I'm very proud of is that even though our organization, like many, was very hard hit by COVID-19 in many respects, uh, despite those financial effects that it has caused for us, our funding levels uh, for our scientific initiatives has not wavered. We have maintained our commitment um, to advancing a cure and to improving quality of life. And we're very proud of that. And I hope that you're proud of us uh, for maintaining that commitment. And I would, as the saying goes, 
you know, that makes the tree's roots go deeper. I would say we're continuing to go deeper. Not only do we maintain uh, the work that we're doing, we're actually going deeper with it. A couple of examples uh, that relate to our topic tonight is that earlier <clears throat> this year, we released uh, the second cut of the data from our uh, patient reported outcomes study uh, based on our Live Yes Insights assessments. And this study is in our 70 year history, certainly the largest study uh, in our organization's uh, history. The report, if you haven't seen it, I really encourage you to go to our website and download it. It's called How It Hurts. It was based on 40,000 respondents to the insights assessments. And some of the things that came out of it are really very uh, shocking. If you're living with the pain presented by arthritis, they won't be shocking to you, I'm sure, because of, the, of, of how you're dealing with the effects of arthritis on a daily basis. But I think it gives for those who maybe are not living with chronic pain, I think it gives a very realistic portrait of what living with chronic pain uh, is like. 100% of respondents reported pain in the last seven days. Four or five uh, are experiencing more difficulties in their daily function compared to the rest of the population. Half are saying that they have sleep that is actually worse than the greater population. 90% of respondents indicated that pain interferes with their daily life. And so it was it was uh, in, fueled, if you will, by the findings in this report that has really propelled us forward into, into our commitment to helping the arthritis community mitigate pain. And uh, we've launched a three-year pain initiative to help uh, people with arthritis achieve one million pain-related goals. And, and in this sort of thread of going deeper with our mission, we actually launched uh, a powerful new app over the summer called VIM. Wherever you go, whether it's on uh, your, your Apple device or your Android device, you can download Vim. And through Vim, you can receive uh, real-time support. Uh, we can connect you to some of the best resources that are out there that are available by the Arthritis Foundation. And it certainly enables people with arthritis to set and achieve uh, goals to help mitigate pain in their daily life. So I encourage you, if you haven't already downloaded that, to do so. But I make those remarks because tonight you're going to be hearing specifically the work uh, that we're doing in partnership with our colleagues who are on the line from the University of Kentucky and from UNC. You're going to be hearing more about how we're working together to really conquer pain, specifically uh, in the area of osteoarthritis. So as I said, uh, we've got a great lineup for you, and I don't want to keep us from it any further. And I believe at this point, I'm going to hand to my colleague, Jason Kim, uh, who is a great colleague and a great partner on the scientific side of the house and the work that we do. And so, Jason, I'm going to pass it to you, and it's all yours. Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, thanks for that introduction, and thanks for this opportunity to speak. Um, and also, you know, thank you and the, the executive leadership team for you know, your persistent support of science. Um, I think especially with the, the times we had last year, um, it was really you know, courageous to continue to support science and maintain our funding levels. Um, and hopefully uh, you know, the rest of the, the folks here will get to see some of uh, what we've been trying to do um, over the last couple of years. Uh, it's my, I guess my honor and uh, pleasure to introduce the speakers, but also uh, maybe set the scene for them uh, and for the audience here on what we've been doing as part of the research program in a way. Um, so if I can go to the next slide, uh, I'll be brief and just try to uh, condense to just a few bullet points. Uh, a few years ago, we decided to pivot from basic science to clinical research, and we decided to build on this foundation that we had in biomarkers, in uh, advanced imaging and biochemical markers, uh, and specifically target PTOA of the knee and ankle. Um, and PTOA, and you'll hear more about this uh, from our speakers, is, is where OA can begin. So uh, we just took this opportunity and built out this, uh, what we're calling the uh, clinical trial network or the OACTN, um, and fill it with a bunch of fantastic investigators and continue to try to expand that network and uh, you know create this uh, diversity of expertise. And so to kind of show that in the next slide, you'll see that uh, you know uh, in 2019, uh, we weren't really called a network. Uh, I think people were calling us more of a group. And then uh, when we got to last year, we had 
uh, a bunch of different projects that you can see in these little boxes, the black, the blue, and the, the yellow and red um, that were interlinked between all of these sites uh, across the US. Um, and maybe if we can zoom into the next slide, uh, you know, all of those boxes represent a lot of fantastic uh, institutions that you know you all have heard of. Um, and uh, I just wanted to show that we have, uh, you know, really we've really loaded up on uh, the intellectual side uh, to be able to battle away. And so in the next slide, um, I just wanted to emphasize from here we're we're trying to get to cures, as Rick said, and cures for us means more treatment options. And uh, I hope that will come in phase two interventional clinical trials. Um, and uh, to maybe further uh, emphasize that uh, that direction that we're going in, uh, we're releasing a RFP this year for, uh, for to fund an a, a coordinating center, which is kind of the centerpiece of the series of uh, clinical trials that will be happening over the course of the next few years. And uh, you know that that RFP is to the tune of 2.5 million dollars over five years. And uh, I think you know those clinical trials will be based off of a lot of the work that you'll hear uh, today. And uh, with that, I just want to get right to introducing our speakers in the next slide. Uh, and many of you might have already heard Kale speak, and you know that uh, Kale Jacobs is uh, a great, great speaker, great representative for uh, the foundation and for the CTN. Uh, he's uh, a guy that I've been working with uh, since basically uh, day one of my time here at the foundation. Uh, he is the principal investigator for the MOCA study that you'll hear more about, as well as a, a CTN member, and he's uh, in. He's at the University of Kentucky, the director of research and an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery and sports medicine. Uh, he'll also be joined by his colleague Caitlin Connolly, who's an also an investigator for the MOCA study and an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky as well. Um, I was always struck by uh, how you know patient forward Caitlin is, and I think that will certainly come through when when you guys hear from her. And uh, we also have the pleasure of uh, hearing from Jeff Spang, who's an investigator for the biomechanical changes after ACLR study, a really descriptive title for, for that project. And he's an orthopedic surgeon, but also assistant professor at the Department of Orthopedics at the University of North Carolina uh, at Chapel Hill. Um, and uh, Jeff was supposed to uh, sort of uh, uh, represent the UNC team but uh, luckily, due to some, uh, you know, maybe unfortunate travel situation that Ryan Pietro Simone had, uh, who's also an investigator, who's a uh, principal investigator for the study, uh, Brian will also be joining us here. Um, unfortunately, his picture is not here, um, so we apologize for that. But um, you'll see him on Zoom pretty soon. So with that, I'll get us started with uh, Kale. So Kale, if you please. Thank you, Jason. It's definitely been a pleasure working hand in hand with you over the past couple of years. <clears throat> Next, please. So <clears throat> a little bit about me, just like Jason mentioned, I'm the director of orthopedic research at the University of Kentucky. I'm a member of the OA Clinical Trials Network, and, and I'm an osteoarthritis researcher. And I think what we've learned over the past couple of years is what that really means is very different to different people. And osteoarthritis is such a multi multifaceted disease and involves experts from so many different fields. Uh, next, please. So what words do you associate with osteoarthritis? Well, we asked this to a local network, uh, which is the Osteoarthritis Alliance of Kentucky. So that involves um, a lot of different subspecialties. So we have orthopedic surgeons, uh, 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 um, orthopedic researchers, muscle physiologists, physical therapists, psychologists, pharmacists. We have a lot of different people that bring different expertise. And we ask that question to that group. And you'll see there's a lot of different responses, right? So um, a lot of them are very nerdy because we're a lot of researchers, right? So there's cartilage and muscle and, and collagen and things like that and biomechanics. Uh, but I think the predominant one in the middle is pain. 
right? And and I think as Rick mentioned with the Live Yes pro, uh, program, that that pain is really the driving force behind a lot of the different research that we do, and everything we're really doing is trying to prevent that future pain uh, for these patients. Next, please. So more than one in ten American adults has osteoarthritis in one form or another, and it's an exceedingly uh, increasingly expensive uh, condition for the healthcare community. And it's a disease of the whole joint. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that, that it not, it doesn't just involve cartilage breakdown, but also progressive changes to the bone and surrounding musculature. And um, when you think of osteoarthritis, I think most people think of primary or idiopathic OA. And that's more the osteoarthritis that is associated with metabolic or it's chronic onset tied to obesity and inactivity or aging and there's no clear trigger event that initiates that whereas post-traumatic osteoarthritis or ptoa involves changes that are secondary to a traumatic injury and this now represents the most common cause of military disability but it's not just a problem for our armed servicemen and women it post-traumatic oa represents about 12 percent of all osteoarthritis that we see clinically. And really this is secondary to a number of different injuries, but primarily from fractures that involve the joint surface or athletic injuries that result in ligament or cartilage damage. And it's difficult sometimes to think who's at risk of osteoarthritis. So this is an old picture of the larger Jacobs family. So this is my mom and dad, my brothers, the spouses, all the, all the kids. So when you look at this picture, if you had to guess who would have osteoarthritis right now, who, who would you think, right? Probably the white haired gentleman on the left, right? White hair was the giveaway. Not necessarily true, but go ahead and click. So my mom does have bilateral uh, moderate to, I'm sorry, moderate to severe knee arthritis at this point, And it's more that primary idiopathic way that you would think of. However, at just as much risk are both my brother and my wife who both suffered uh, acute knee injuries during sports during their senior years of high school. And they're both starting to develop some early signs of osteoarthritis. Next, please. So with the OA Clinical Trial Network, we've really come together as a group to share information to improve quality and discovery. And we share design standards, protocols, laboratories and training, um, access to clinical trial design. Um, we share information about drug development and things like that. And I think you can never underestimate the power of when people come together. And this topic, the whole concept of OA research and, and PTOA research, think about it this way. We have researchers from Duke, North Carolina, and Kentucky that all still work together during the month of March. So even at the peak of basketball season, we can put our differences aside and move forward with this important topic. Next. And the OA clinical trial has kind of three current um, questions or lines of research. <clears throat> so first, we really need to better the way we measure OA progression. And this helps us identify how someone's progressing through the disease, but also improves our ability to, to tell how uh, interventions are working. So we can see easier if something's working or it's not. We don't have to wait years to find that end result. Uh, we're also working to determine what interventions are required to alter the progression of osteoarthritis. And then finally, who are the most high risk patients or kind of the optimal first target of who should be um, targeted with new interventions? Next. So part of that deals with how we currently measure joint health, and that's with x-rays. So they are inexpensive, <clears throat> easy to acquire. There's an x-ray machine in every orthopedic clinic, most primary care clinics. And it certainly has some disadvantages in that it's a two-dimensional radiographic image of a 3D condition. And the big problem is that you can't see soft tissue. So when you look at that X-ray on the right, you see the bone on the top, so that's the femur, and then the bone on the bottom is the tibia. And you'll see in between the two, there's kind of a space, right? Well, that space is an air. So there's not just a gap between the bones but cartilage doesn't show up on an x-ray. So that space is filled with cartilage. So, uh, but unfortunately we can't necessarily see the cartilage. We can only see the space where the cartilage likely lies. So you can see there might be some issues with how we use this for, for OA research. Next. And traditionally what we've done with 
with x-rays is we quantify the severity of arthritis based on the kelgren lawrence grade, which is a subjective grade, and we kind of put people into categories based on how severe their changes are. So on the top left would be KL0, so no arthritis whatsoever, and that progresses across the top. And then on the bottom right, we see KL4, which is severe arthritis. And if you were to look, kind of have your eyes bounce back and forth between KL0 and KL4, you can easily see there's a difference on the right side of the image in the space between the femur and the tibia, right? So that space on the right side where the cartilage would normally be is kind of gone in that bottom right image. And you can also see there's changes to the bone as well. So the bone looks a little bit more smooth in the first top image, but then as you progress, you'll see like on the bottom image, there's not only a change to the, um, where the bone has become more sclerotic, there's also more bone spurs or osteophytes. And so we see a loss of cartilage and bony changes that go along with this disease. But the problem with the kelgren lawrence grade, well, we can easily see the difference between a zero and a four. Now, if you look at a zero and a one, or between a one and a two, it becomes very difficult to see the difference between a one and a two. So for research purposes, we have a very difficult time trying to see if someone has progressed from mild to moderate arthritis. And as such, we have a hard time figuring out if any of the treatments that we're using are really working and changing the progression for them. Next, please. And now when we talk about uh, post-traumatic osteoarthritis, this kind of confounds things because with post-traumatic arthritis, it's often been referred to as a silent killer of the joint. So the graph on the left are outcome scores after an ACL reconstruction. So after a sports knee injury, they've had surgery. And the scores, higher score would be better, 100 would be a perfect score. So we see on the left that patients before surgery have moderate scores, and then at two, six, and 10 years after surgery, those outcome scores are significantly increased and those are maintained. That's great news, right? So that means ACL reconstruction has done a great job of improving the patient's pain and function. And we see that that's maintained out to 10 years. But, next slide. But what we've seen in some of our previous work is that cartilage breakdown begins within weeks after ACL reconstruction and it's happening without pain. So that's why we refer to it as a silent killer is that the progressive cartilage changes are happening, but they're happening in the absence of symptoms. So here the image we see is one of our um, synovial fluid biomarkers of cartilage breakdown. So from the fluid in the knee, we can measure how much cartilage, cartilage is breaking down at different time points. And here, um, the first time point was a one week after ACL injury, and then we see the day of surgery, and then one week after surgery, that marker remains level, like pretty level and not much change over time. But then just four weeks after surgery, we see a significant increase. So this process of cartilage breakdown is occurring early after surgery. And then when we carry that forward, between 50 and 80% of patients have irreversible cartilage loss on x-rays 10 years after surgery. And that's can be problematic when we think about the average age of an ACL reconstruction patient, right? So these are often pa patients that are having surgery in their late teens or early 20s. If you add 10 years onto that, now you're talking about someone that has early osteoarthritis in their late 20s, early 30s. So that's uh, certainly we want something that we need to be able to, to change that progression. And we definitely need an early detection system. Next. So the search for better methods of assessment is really uh, plays to the strengths of the OA clinical trial network. And in terms of both biochemical, so some of those biomarkers that we look for in the fluids, so whether it be fluid from the joint or measures we can, uh, markers that we can look for in the serum or even urine to detect changes in cartilage over time, but also imaging biomarkers. So um, with MRI or um, advanced CT uh, scan techniques. And this will allow us to have earlier detection of OA progression and the ability to track improvements with treatment and definitely an area of expertise of our investigators. Next. So there's a number of studies ongoing that are looking at different biomarkers after um, ACL or after injury and um, looking at imaging biomarkers specifically. So Don Anderson and the group from the University of Iowa are looking at weight bearing CT after both ankle fracture and ACL reconstruction. Shamila Majumdar at UC San Francisco, Xiao Xuan Li at Cleveland Clinic and I are working on looking at MRI changes in bone shape 
So looking at how bone shape changes after, after surgery and how that is uh, indicative of later cartilage loss. And then Michael Albro at the uh, Hospital for Special Surgery is also using Raman needle arthroscopy to analyze cartilage quality just based on the, the reflective characteristics of the cartilage. So a number of different uh, different looks at how we can tackle the same problem. This is where it's really fun to be part of this network because we see there's so many unique and different ways we can, we can address the same issue. Next, please. So the group at Iowa in their ankle fracture study is uh, trying to look to see, to evaluate changes in tibio-tailor joint space using weight-bearing CT. So when we look at these images, so this is an ankle, a patient that's had an ankle fracture and you see the images on the top, it's pretty easy to see that there's a number of plates and a lot of screws involved. And if you're trying to look at the kind of the dark space between the bones, it's very difficult, right? So we think back to the, the knee x-ray, it's very easy to see if that space was there or not. But now our view can be obscured because we can't see the joint as, as easily because of all the hardware that's in place. And we also can't use MRI because of all the metal hardware that's there, that's there as well. And I think our circle is just a little bit off, but the image on the bottom right if you just look to the, I guess, four o'clock on that red circle, you'll see there's a bony fragment that sticks down lower than the rest of the, the rest of the fracture. And what we couldn't see on the top images, now with CT, we can see there's a loss of joint space and Don's group can check, track this change over time, both in the position of the bones, but also then uh, mapping out the joint space width between the bones using this weight bearing CT. Next, please. And this is really how they go about doing that. So the image on the left would be the ankle joint um, early after surgery. And then the image in the middle is where they overlay uh, a, a second image collected one year or two years after injury. And then from that overlay, they're able to then map on the image on the right, the uh, joint space width between the, the two bones. And if you look, if you remember back to our previous picture, there was that one little hook towards the front of the ankle joint, that one little piece of bone that was sitting down low. But with, with a bird's eye view, now looking at this the heat map of joint space width, we can see where that hook in the top right, where we have a lot more yellow and a little bit of red, we can start to see that that joint space width has, has really closed down. And that's where we would expect to see then more cartilage loss. So more cartilage loss, the bones come closer together. Next, please. And then we're taking a similar approach uh, to look at bone shape changes over time after an ACL reconstruction. So on an MRI, um, we can then look to see these changes over time. And on the left, you'll see an MRI image from a knee that had extreme OA and in the middle after an ACL injury, and then we can superimpose those two and see where the differences might, might lie. And what we found in early studies is that after surgery, we see that the shape of the bone, so the distal femur, the bottom end of the femur, actually flattens out and becomes wider. Uh, and that actually changes the forces that go through the knee and can change then the forces on the cartilage and can lead to for future cartilage breakdown. Next, please. But what we don't know is what impacts this cart this bone shape change after injury. So we don't know if there are differences between older and younger patients, if there's differences between the sexes, if this happens to be more pronounced for patients with increased BMI or body weight. So these are all things we're trying to learn more about this biomarker to see like how well can it inform about OA progression. And then we're also looking to see if this is altered by a preoperative anti-inflammatory treatment. So these are patients that were uh, completed a study in the past, but now by sharing uh, MRI images across institutions, we can pool data and start to look at some of these uh, different questions. And then finally, we wanna see if changes in bone shape influence the forces borne by the cartilage or how much physical activity influences bone shape. So is it something where we need to perhaps load the bone less during the first couple of weeks after surgery. But as Dr. Spang and Dr. Pietro Simone will talk later, we definitely don't want to underload for too long or we might be creating a different problem altogether. Next. And finally, the Raman needle. So this is really some fascinating work. I was amazed the first time this was presented. So they are able to use the reflective uh, characteristics. So the wavelength of the light that is reflecting off the cartilage to see changes, uh, early de de degenerative changes in the cartilage 
after injury. So this is something that they've experimented with on animal models, and now they're trying to, to move up to larger animal models and, and those that have had um, injuries that would, that would induce post-traumatic OA. And with that, I will kick over to Dr. Spang, who's going to talk about the study that they're, they're doing at the University of North Carolina, looking at biomedical, biomechanical changes after ACL injury and surgery. Thanks a lot. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yep, yep. So next slide, please. I'm happy to be a stand-in. Brian Pietro-Simone, who is viewed in the other image, is my research partner here, the director of the Motion Science Institute, and we're both part of the Sports Medicine Institute here at UNC. I'm a clinician, so my main thing to get into this topic is what's happening with my ACL reconstruction patients. Part of the earlier work we've done here looks at the age of patients, what's changing in the percentage of people at a certain age that are getting ACL reconstructions. And across the country, what we know is that the group of people for whom ACL surgeries are going up the fastest at the fastest rate is women under the age of 18. So what you're talking about is a group of patients that are getting injuries at younger and younger ages. And then we know if it takes 10 years to see articular cartilage changes on x-rays, something's happening in those 10 years and we need to find a way to change it. Next slide. We're focused here on biomechanics. Obviously we know that the injury changes a lot of how people move. And so they're moving differently, both through the initial post-operative period, and then three months and six months and nine months and 12 months. And our focus is it's not enough to know that somebody has abnormal biomechanics. What we really needed to do is define patterns. Are there is there a relationship between the injuries that people have, including meniscus, including articular cartilage and how they're moving? And more importantly, can these abnormal biomechanical changes be improved. And what we're finding is that there are ways to modify how people are moving in the immediate post-operative period, in the immediate year following surgery that we think will lead to keeping the cartilage healthy for longer. And obviously you're talking about how you move and we talk about loading. Loading is the amount of force that's passed across the joints. So next slide. Next slide in there. So a simple study for us and part of the framework is to look at how muscle conditioning relates to MRI. Using specialized MRI techniques where you're looking at the quality of the cartilage, where you're looking at the cartilage health in a way that you're examining the cartilage health before x-ray changes would be seen, we can show relationships between quadriceps weakness and the MRI changes. What we have to do is put a bigger picture together and say, we know that weakness causes MRI changes. What's happening with those MRI changes? Are they reversible? If we change the strength of the quadriceps, can we make the MRIs look better? And so these are the things that are higher level. And I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Pietro Simone so he can get into more and more depth about how the loading is changing and what our goals are in this next study. So next slide, please. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so one of the things that we're seeing right right after uh, uh, injury is that these individuals, um, you know, are uh, coming in with much weaker muscles, right, that are associated with these changes in uh, MRI, uh, which we know um, may influence, you know, the development of, of osteoarthritis. So one of the, the, the reasons we're interested in strength is that it affects the way that you move. And one of the ways that we can measure that was, is with this three-dimensional motion capture. And uh, if you want to just click on that top um, video right there. So we ask individuals to come in and actually walk across force plates. Um, and while they're walking across the force plate, we can actually measure the force that um, is going through uh, their joints, as well as understanding how their joints are moving um, you know, as they're walking. Here's a look at some of the outcomes that we can measure here on the right. So that top figure actually is a uh, rendition of a, of a vertical ground reaction force. So that red line shows the amount of force in an ACL reconstructed limb as somebody impacts the ground. So as you first impact the ground, it increases 
and then it, it, it decreases a little bit as you go into mid stance and then increases again as you push off. What we see is that ACL reconstructed individuals at six months after uh, injury are, are actually uh, showing decreased loading compared to uninjured controls. So they are actually have less loads through their joint and through their extremity than, than individuals at, with the same age at the same activity level who do not have uh, ACL reconstruction. And we also see in that bottom figure there that they have a stiffer knee joint. So this is a look at their knee flexion angle as they um, move over the force plates. And you can see that uh, these individuals actually have stiffer knee joints. So these two biomechanical features we've seen actually are associated with these uh, changes uh, at, in, their, in their cartilage. So we see that individuals are actually underloading um, rather than overloading their joints very early on. If you want to go to that next slide. One of, one of the other things that we've noticed is that not only are they underloading their joint with every step that they take, but they also take less steps per day. So we see that if we put a, an accelerometer on them, sort of like a research grade Fitbit, we can actually see that these individuals will take less steps than their age matched uh, uh, controls. And less steps per day is also associated with some of those biochemical markers that Kale was talking about um, that are linked to cartilage breakdown. So it's possible that not only are they taking you know, uh, or, or putting less force to their joint, but they're also taking less steps, which may actually be deconditioning the cartilage. Now, what we don't know, right, is how this uh, um, changes longitudinally. Um, and we really don't have a lot of data early in that first year after ACL reconstruction. So our study seeks to focus on this. So the aim, aim one of our uh, study that we're currently doing, if you go to that next slide, uh, is really to characterize these changes in muscle strength, gait biomechanics, and steps per day through that first year. So we're comprehensively measuring these changes, um, trying to locate when they may actually be decreasing um, and, and maybe uh, normalizing over that first year. We're also in uh, the next slide there. Um, looking at how these changes in strength, biomechanics, and steps per day are associated with some of these early biochemical changes at their joints. So understanding how um, individuals who may uh, have uh, more muscle weakness, you know, less loading through their joint and take less steps per day actually may have greater um, inflammation and, and type 2 collagen turnover. And then finally, we want to understand if these early changes actually associate with, uh, these early changes in biomechanics actually associate with their changes in their cartilage, as well as um, uh, the changes in patient reported function that Kale talked about before. Now, the purpose of this um, on the next slide is that we hope that when we determine the exact nature of these biomechanical changes that associate with cartilage breakdown, we'll be able to actually address them and modify them. So some of the uh, interventions that we're working at on uh, currently, one being gait uh, biofeedback, where we're able to measure uh, how far individuals are away from what's normal loading at the joint and provide personalized strategies to actually bring them back to normal loading. Um, and we can do this in real time by having them walk, walk on this uh, force instrumented treadmill that actually measures their gait biomechanics as they're moving and provides them uh, real time feedback where they're able to actually normalize their loading. We're also working on uh, physical activity promotion um, uh, interventions where we can actually uh, monitor and provide them cues to normalize their loading progressively over time. Uh, with hopes that we would be able to kind of um, stop these, these uh, compositional changes early on and hopefully decrease some of the, the development of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So we're a recent member of the Clinical Trials Network, and as the map expanded, we're one of the places that the map has expanded to encompass. And here at North Carolina, we're very excited about being a part of this group. Awesome. 
excited to have more people here. So I'm Caitlin Conley. I am at the University of Kentucky, and um, I've been blessed to be within the um, Arthritis Foundation now for a little while, uh, multiple years. And um, during my time here at the University of Kentucky, I also have been able to be involved in a lot of different trials that are specifically targeting um, post-traumatic osteoarthritis. And one of the things that um, has really come about that we're really excited about is different ways that we can really take the whole picture of our treatment programs in these intervention studies and hopefully make them so that we're pretty much ready to hit the ground running um, once we get some of these results, which I, everyone wants to hopefully have that silver bullet when we get to it. So I'm going to talk really about the role of implementation science um, to design studies um, that really provide solutions that are meaningful to patients. And I'm going to be talking specifically about that in context of one of our ongoing studies um, here. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the study that I'm going to be highlighting is monolucas as a pro, um, potential chondroprotective treatment following anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. And this is a study that's involving multiple sites um, within the network. It's um, here at UK, um, UCSF, and also Cleveland Clinic. And uh, go ahead, next slide. I know Kale already went through a lot of these um, great individuals, but the premise of this MOCA trial, um, Kale talked about when we were looking at the bio, um, biomarkers and how your cartilage is already having this um, detrimental effect almost right after injury that none of us really would think about at that point in time. But on the flip side, we also have this persistent inflammation that's occurring. So when I talk to the patients, it's, it's almost describing it as this toxic soup that's within their knee joint that we're, we're talking about a ligament that's torn, but we really need to also consider all the different biochemical reactions that are occurring. So I think this graph does a, a great representation to see one week after injury, as expected, we see high inflammation levels that um, start to go down um, by the time we have day of surgery. I will say that um, some of these patients were treated with corticosteroids, so some of that decrease is um, medically induced as well. But the real fascinating thing we see is that we do surgery and we fix the ligament and we go in, we're like, okay, we're going to go do rehab, make sure that we're going through on our return to whatever activity that individual is um, expecting to do. But one week after surgery, we have inflammation levels that um, exceed um, what we saw post-injury. And when we look at almost one month, that four-week time point on the graph, all the way on the right-hand side, our values are, are just starting to return to what we saw um, post-injury and in some cases haven't even returned to what we are expecting. Um, so this kind of brings about this question of what, what's really going on within this knee joint here that uh, we potentially can treat to help these patients? Because we all know, I mean, Kale did a beautiful job presenting that. And I, even with Brian and stuff going over the functional mechanics, we know that there's deficits that these patients are going to be encountering as they go on to do their rehab and recover. And, and so we really want to try to make sure we're addressing all the different aspects of this. And one thing our group has really started to identify is that PTA really, it shares some of the common um, pathways and different proteins in rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis, which changes a little bit of the thought process and how we want to treat this. Um, and so our group had been looking at different preoperative interventions, postoperative treatments, and really so far, we're not seeing specific long-term benefits from these different um, interventions that have been injections at one time point. So now we really want to start to look at, okay, how can we really capitalize on these patients and address some of these biochemical changes that were going on and also make sure that we have some advantageous stages for these patients when we're going through these rehabs and higher functional demands and such. Next slide. So for the MOCA trial, we're taking 30 patients and we are randomizing them um, to uh, either a six month um, course of monolucas or a placebo. And you might be a little surprised to hear us say monolucas and wonder what why that medication would be chosen. And it actually is um, a medication that targets a specific pro-inflammatory pro pathway. Um, so the patients get a, a benefit of having some allergy medicine as well, which in Kentucky, I know could be a benefit because they say that we have terrible allergies. I've been told we're the allergy capital. I don't know if I fully believe it or not yet, but um, I can say that uh, I have suffered from that just the same. Uh, and so our site and also UCSF is going to enroll patients here um, to capitalize on recruitment and uh, the biochemical uh, changes I discussed and imaging biomarkers um, are going to be done at UCSF. Cleveland Clinic and Duke. Um, so we are collecting blood and urine for the biochemical analyses, and then um, we'll be doing our um, standard MRI imaging for the T1 row to really capitalize on just the, the cartilage itself and structure integrity. 
And, and the beauty about this MOCA trial is that this is a, a great study to really highlight the strengths of the network because it went from being in the napkin stage, which it, it was written on a napkin. So that is actually kind of a, a really great depiction of how it started all the way to being an implementation within six months. And, and that really wouldn't be possible without the infrastructure that's already been built within this network. So it's a great way to highlight all the fruits of the labor. Um, next slide. But as I talked about, one of the things we really want to focus on here is how our interventions are going to capitalize on the patient and really be able to be determined to be effective, but then also be utilized within the real world setting pretty immediately after. And so one of the things we need to also consider when we're looking at the different outcomes, those biochemical outcomes, the MRIs and such, we want to also look at how this intervention is being perceived by the patient, uh, because it's fantastic if we find an intervention that targets all those inflammation outcomes I talked about, targets those cartilage degradation, and is able to really just decrease their pain and move them forward. But if it is an intervention that the patients are not in any way, shape, or form going to administer or adhere to once it's done in the real world, we really need to take a step back then and, be, and figure out how we can make this fit in their real world. And as I just highlighted, we went from the napkin stage to implementation in six months. Um, so everything has a time component to it. So implementation science takes evidence-based practice um, things is actually what they use in the literature because things can be so broad where we're talking about interventions all the way to hospital systems and tries to really facilitate a quick uptake to it. And one of the ways that we can facilitate a quick uptake is to look at some of these different outcomes within the same trials where we're evaluating the implement or the intervention itself. So for the MOCA trial, we're actually going to be um, looking at uh, going through and evaluating the feasibility and acceptance um, of this intervention for these patients. So we are going to be asking them how their perceptions are as they've been going through this different intervention and how acceptable this intervention was for this, for this individual. We want to make sure that they actually feel like this was something that was going to fit within their lifestyle. Because as we all know, we need to know, make sure that medication is something that these patients are going to adhere to as it's been instructed. Um, and then also see if there's just barriers we don't understand. We're not living the patient's experiences. We don't know what they're encountering every day. Um, we also don't know provider-wise and in institutions what they're encountering. So now by us having UK and UCSF involved in this, we can kind of get an idea between different institutions. Um, we can evaluate providers' perceptions, but then also really looking at the patients and seeing what their feedback is on this. And that will really help us as we go to move forward with these different um, interventions, um, specifically in this study, the monolucas. So uh, I think that next bullet is great because you know the surgeon's really concerned about the graft. Um, one of our surgeons loves to say that he does he does his part in the OR, but it's on the patient to do their part for the next six months. Um, so the graft's done great um, for OA researchers. We really want to establish the cartilage condition and its integrity, um, and that's really where now with implementation science and um, the beauty about the MoCo trial, we're really wanting to encompass that patient as well, so that we can make sure that this intervention is going to be something um, that can be adaptable. All right, next slide. So one of the other things I just highlighted with the MoCa study is um, treatments and interventions that can be done right then and there in the same trial. Um, but one of the things that we also need to know from a patient perspective before we can sometimes even start a trial is, is where to target a treatment. And that's hard with some of these PTO patients where we don't really understand fully what's going on years down the road. Um, so we highlighted all the way up to one month after injury and sur after surgery, but um, we know there's a lot of patients still that are in this in-between stage where they are way post their ACL surgery, but they're not ready for a total knee yet. And we need to be able to understand how we can help these patients during that period of time. And so we're actually doing a pilot study right now to evaluate overall function like Brian highlighted and strength and also those biochemical biomarkers. So we can just have a baseline understanding of where these patients are. But then at the same point in time, be able to compare them to a non-arthritic patient population um, who are 10 years post ACL reconstruction to help us identify those little um, differences between patient populations. And then we really want to get an idea of where these patients have been seeking treatment and what treatments they've been utilizing um, up until this point. 
because we know there's a whole host of treatments available out there and really start investigating these patients' perceptions with these different treatments. What's worked? What's not worked? What's been feasible for them to do? What's not been acceptable? Um, we know that some of these treatments come with high costs. Um, so if it's a high cost and the patient's not getting benefit out of it, that, that's something we really we need to know because that's something to take in consideration as we go to make sure that our studies are focusing on treatments that are going to be able to be utilized in the real world. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Kindly. So I'll pick up here and I'm going to hit the accelerator a little bit because I see we're, we're moving along in time. But uh, the OA Clinical Trial Network has another uh, intervention study. So in addition to MOCA, there's the COMET trial, and we all pride ourselves on the acronyms we come up with for our studies. So this is usually a, it's a silent competition. No one wants to admit it's a competition, but we're all trying to come up with the most clever acronyms. So uh, the COMET trial is being done at the Cleveland Clinic, and they're looking at an injection of an extended release corticosteroid after partial meniscectomy. Next slide. And we know this is a very, very common condition. And in patients that are older, so older relative to ACL patients, so for those that are 40 and older that are having a meniscectomy, this is really a great clinical, clinical example of early osteoarthritis because we know so many of these patients go on to osteoarthritis. And the group at Cleveland Clinic has also demonstrated that their inflammatory profiles based on the inflammatory markers in the synovial fluid in the joint at the time of surgery correlates really well with pain. Next slide. So what they're looking to do is this randomized trial of the extended release corticosteroid versus placebo to see if that improves pain and patient, record, and patient reported outcomes, uh, but also changes in synovial fluid, urinary biomarkers of inflammation and cartilage turnover, and MRI changes over time. And we're all using at all the different sites and all the different studies, we're all using the same MRI um, sequences and measurement techniques to make sure the data can be pooled and reanalyzed in different ways in the future. So just another way that the OA Clinical Trial Network really does work as a network. Next slide. And then finally, uh, it's not just PTOA, but we also have some, some projects going with patients with primary or idiopathic OA. And here's where we're looking at the interplay between obesity, depression, and, osteo and osteoarthritis progression. In one of our previous studies, we saw that uh, patients that had the combination of obesity and depression were actually the ones that had the most rapid breakdown in, in cartilage biomarkers. And, you know, on the NERD side, we came up with a really, uh, what we thought was an elegant way to explain this, that it was a physiological response, a stacking of all these inflammatory comorbidities, when it could really just be that this group has the hardest time engaging and staying engaged in an exercise program. And we know that movement is good for the knee. So that's where we're working with psychologists at the, at uh, Harvard University and, and Mass General to develop a Zoom-based mind-body program. So it's a, a group therapy session, um, just like we're having this meeting today, uh, for folks that have this combination of comorbidities to help improve pain coping strategies, uh, but also promote a healthy diet and physical activity. And uh, we have one project underway. We've also worked with Jason and the Arthritis Foundation to help de develop a project that's specifically for um, either African-American or black uh, folks that have uh, osteoarthritis, as well as our uh, military veterans that have knee OA as well. So we're, we're trying to branch this out in other areas to identify the specific needs of different patient populations. Next slide. So again, I think across all our different families at all the different sites, we all wake up every day passionate to work on this topic because it affects not only uh, those that are a little bit older than us, but when we start to consider the impact of different sports injuries that happen during our youth, it can affect our kids, our friends, our spouses, our neighbors, and so on. And the Arthritis Foundation has really been a driving force behind these efforts. Thank you. Or you can go ahead and click to the next slide. Thank you so much, Dr. Kale. Um, we, we can open it up for questions now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen unless you, uh, unless there's anyone that wants me to refer back to a specific slide for their question. And I'll ask that Kristen um, monitor the chat feature, see if there's any questions that um, that we have for the speakers tonight. I'll stop sharing so that we can see each other. Perfect. 
Perfect. Any questions that you have you might have for any of the speakers that we had this evening? I think they answered them all in advance. <laughs> OK, well, with no speak with no questions this evening, thank you so much. Um, there's no questions in the chat feature. Kristen just checked. Um, thank you all so much for joining tonight. We thank all of our speakers for joining us. This is always truly a pleasure to be able to hear the great advances we're making in science. Um, we have recorded tonight's session. We'll be sending that out to those that were able to attend tonight and for those that uh, were not able to join us. Um, if you have any questions moving forward, you can reach out to your staff partner or to one of us on the call, and we'd be happy to answer it. Thanks for your time tonight, everyone. Thank you Thanks, all. Everyone. Have a good Bye. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Yeah.